my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place for women to come together to share their childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from women all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Peanut. Peanut is an app that helps you make meaningful connections throughout all stages of motherhood. Peanut provides a safe space for mothers, expectant mothers, and those trying to conceive to build friendships, ask questions, and find support by introducing you to others nearby who are at a similar stage in life. Peanut provides access to a community who is there to listen, share information, and offer valuable advice, whether it's understanding IVF, adoption, pregnancy, baby's first years, or beyond. Peanut is a place to connect with other moms in the thick of it. I've been loving using Peanut myself. I just signed up, and you're able to go in there and choose what stage of motherhood you're at, whether you're trying to conceive or pregnant or have babies and what their ages are, and then it'll find groups for you to join with people near you or topic-based groups to get your questions answered. You can select a bunch of different interests and it's all super secure and my favorite part is that it creates a special feed for you to go through and see people posting with similar things so I tried it out just for fun with trying to conceive and saw that you know you could see people sharing their pregnancy tests and everybody giving their input so it's kind of like a very personalized and focused version of other social media apps that you might use so stay tuned at the end of this episode and I'll be talking to Trisha from peanut all about the app and you can download it for free today at thebirthhour.com slash peanut or by searching for peanut in the app store. Today's guest is Hannah, who's going to talk about her experience with hyperemesis while pregnant with her son, and then again while pregnant with her surprise twins, which she was able to have as an out-of-hospital birth. Hi, Hannah. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Hi, Brian. I'm excited to be here. Can you tell listeners a little bit about you and your family? Yeah. My name is Hannah. I'm married to my husband, Michael. He's my high school sweetheart, and we've been married about five years. Um, I have a son, Silas. He's two and a half, and my twin daughters are turning one. Uh, Their names are Anessi and Sabine. All right, so we have two stories to hear. Um, Do you want to start with your pregnancy with Silas and how that went? Sure. So my husband and I decided to stop preventing in October of 2015, and um, the next month we were pregnant, which was quite a surprise. Um, I kind of was expecting a normal pregnancy, like be a little bit sick in the first trimester, second trimester would be awesome. And then the third trimester, you'd be as big as a house and you would feel terrible. (laughs) So, um, it was a huge surprise to me when at six weeks I started throwing up, uh, constantly. (laughs) So, um, I think everyone who has morning sickness is kind of taken aback at how disgusting you feel. Um, but the throwing up continued and continued and I started losing weight to the point where I had lost 10 pounds in like two weeks. So we decided to go to urgent care after a few days of not being able to keep anything down. They sent us right over to the ER because, uh, they don't really want to deal with pregnant people, um, in urgent care. So we went over to the ER and the nurse practitioner there told me I had hyperemesis, which I had never heard of before. (laughs) She said that usually meant that um, you were going to be severely throwing up and nauseous for a little beyond the first trimester. I had already lost 5% of my body weight, but I would continue to throw up. So she told me that I needed to take um, quite a few medications to be able to control it and be able to continue um, growing my baby. And so that was pretty shocking. Um, I'm generally a more holistic person. And I had been planning to deliver at the birth center, and uh, I was pretty upset when I learned I had to take all these prescriptions. And it was pretty scary just thinking about, you know, the possible risk to my baby um, just with all those prescriptions and medications that I was going to have to take. Um, But I agreed, and we kind of moved on. And the next few weeks, I kept throwing up. I kept losing weight. I felt super miserable. I kept going to the doctor and asking what was happening to me, and they would just kind of tell me that I was just pregnant, and there was nothing wrong, and this is normal. 
Um, but when it started to get into the 16, 17 week range, and I was, had lost about 20 pounds at that point, they told me that I could try doing a Zofran pump, um, which is basically you just stick a needle into yourself and there's medication that comes into your body (laughs) regularly, continuously. Um, when that didn't work either, um, I went to go find a new doctor who could help me the medications. And I was able to find one that gave me like a test medication called Kytril. And I was able to, at that point, it was about 20 weeks and I was able to um, get the vomiting under control a little bit. Um, But that continued throughout the whole pregnancy, which was really hard. Were you getting more like growth scans and stuff like that for the baby because of it? I was at the birth center. So I, they kind of didn't really know what to do with me at first. Um, They just told me to go, they gave me all the regular, you know, go take ginger, try acupuncture, try these herbs, try, you know, bone broth. Like they gave me all of the natural remedies, um, but none of that worked. I wasn't able to keep anything down. So they kind of let me go figure out what I needed to do in the Western medical world. Um, And yeah, they so were you they kind were of great. having dual care, like you the birth center was for yes. your birth, and then you were seeing someone else for yes. Managing and they pregnancy. had they sent me to their person, their doctor, who um, he is the one who kind of sees the birth center moms. He's really okay with um, all of the birth center moms that come in there. They usually what happens is all the birth center moms see him around thirty seven weeks, confirming baby's head down, making sure everything's good to go in case you did have to transfer kind of that. So just there's that knowledge of who that doctor is. So I was going to see him for the medication and he was the one who was kind of prescribing things and telling me, you know, this is kind of normal. And then when it got to be later, it was not normal anymore. And then he kind of was uncomfortable with a medication that I wanted to try. And I forgot to mention that, um, at, during that time, since no one was really able to tell me what was going on, I found a group on baby center called Hypermesis Suffers. And the group admin there was just amazing. And she had done like so, so much research about this um, condition. And uh, she really helped me and a ton of other ladies who were just really at a loss for what what to do and how to find help. Um, she was really great about, about that. So she helped me find that med list combo. And then when I took it to him, he was like, I don't, I don't know about this. Like, let's try the Zofran pump. And that didn't work. So I went to another doctor and she prescribed me that. And that's what ended up working. I bet that was a huge relief to just get a little bit of food to stay down. Yes. Yeah. I was pretty much surviving on popsicles and Hanson soda every day. So I'd have like my one popsicle in the morning and my one can of soda. And Gosh. sometimes that wouldn't even stay down. And so finally at 18 weeks or 20 weeks, whenever I got that medication, um, I finally was able to start eating like bread and um, like a very plain diet. And then I remember 26 weeks, I could start drinking water again. And that was just like, it was the best taste in the world. Cause you're so thirsty when you're pregnant and, and yeah, I just that imagine. cool glass of water was, was wonderful. So yeah, once that started happening, I was, I felt, I felt quite a bit better. Were you able to take, um, vitamins and stuff or was that something they could give you no. through IV? Yeah, no prenatals, unfortunately. So that was pretty emotional for me as your first pregnancy. You yeah. want to do everything right. You want to take the prenatals and you want to um, like make sure you're doing all the things and exercising. And I, I remember like you get those baby updates of like, this is what you should be doing. And here's how your baby's growing. And here's how, you know, the on like baby center, they have the updates. And I just remember thinking like, I can't do any of these things. Like what, <laughs> I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing right now because I was just in the bathroom throwing up all the time. (laughs) So that was hard. So, um, it sounds like you were able to stay with your birth center birth though. Yes, I was, which was amazing. So even though, um, I had all of the issues with the pregnancy, the baby was growing fine. So there was a little bit like just taking everything from you and, um, which I'm so happy about, but yeah, they take everything from you to grow. So the baby was doing great. I was able to have him at the birth center. Okay. Well, do you want to tell me about your birth? Sure. At 40 weeks, five days, um, my water broke at 4.30 a.m. And I got up and I heard that little pop and made it to the bathroom in time for that gush. <laughs> so I was obviously super excited being a few days late. And um, I got my husband up and told my water broke. He was like, great. 
cool. <laughs> Didn't really know what that meant. So my contractions hadn't started. I called my midwife, told her like my water broke. So she told me her exact words were great. We should have a baby by tonight. So that was kind of my expectation of, all right, this is going to be slow. Like I'm just going to relax. I didn't really go back to bed because it was early enough in the morning where I felt okay being up. So like I made myself breakfast, got in a shower. Um, my husband at some point got up and um, was in the bathroom with me and all of a sudden like my contraction started and they were really painful. And I wasn't really expecting that because we had taken the birthing from within class and, and they had gone through like all the stages of labor. So I was kind of expecting like a long pre-labor and then like a 10 hour active labor and then a short transition and, you know, pushing stage. So that was kind of took me by surprise. I thought, uh, if this is how it's going to be for the next day, like I did, what did I get myself into? So those contractions started coming at 10 minutes apart. And then a few minutes later, like I started feeling them a lot more frequently, but it was kind of like big contraction, little contraction, big contraction, little contraction. So I was kind of like, well, these are like three minutes apart. What's going on? And so I asked my husband to start timing and we were both so confused about the timing because it was like the big contraction and the little contraction just threw us off. And so I was like, I can't, I can't do this in the shower anymore. I have to get out. And I just got out of the shower, like sopping wet and just kind of like stumbled around my house because I was really just in so much pain that I didn't know what was going on. And I called my midwife and I said, you know, these, these contractions are really difficult. And all of a sudden one hit and I just let out this huge cuss word and which is not like me. (laughs) So my midwife said, Oh my goodness, like you need to come in right now. Um, and at that point I was in so much pain. I couldn't get my clothes on. It was, I think it was about 7 a.m. at that point. So it had been like two hours. And so my husband was kind of like, wait, we we can't go yet. You've only been in labor for two hours. And I was just like, we're going. So we got in the car and drove down there. And that was when I went into transition, (laughs) which was great. So I just remember this one point, this truck driver, because we had one of those little Camrys, looking down at me and I just stared at him, like giving him the death stare. And he kind of like, his eyes got really big and just kept driving. And that's kind of my only memory (laughs) of the car ride because I was just in so much pain. Um, And I really was very fearful at that point um, because I didn't really know what was going on. And I just knew I was in a lot of pain and I was having back labor, which I wasn't expecting. Um, So I just kind of was in my own world. Like I wasn't really listening to anything around me or processing what was going on. Um, I was just really scared. I don't think I would have been able to articulate that at the time, but I kind of just like went into myself um, because I it wasn't, I was just not expecting <laughs> that level of intensity that quickly. Um, so we got to the birth center around 8 a.m. And I got out and threw up, of course, because... <laughs> Why would I eat toast? I don't know, but I eat toast and I threw it all up all over the sidewalk right outside the birth center. So that was, I'm sure, a pleasant thing for well, someone to pick up. like most people are throwing up that <laughs> transition, so at least you weren't alone there. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I'm they, they had these steps right in front of the birth center and I was just like having so much trouble making it up those, but we finally got in there and they had started filling up the tub. So I, um, I got in the tub. And that really, really relieved so much pressure from my back. Um, I just remember getting in there and thinking like, oh, why why wasn't I in here three hours ago? All I really remember about that time is just asking them why there was so much pain. And I don't really remember anyone telling me like, you're close. Like, no, I don't think anyone even checked me. Um, I think everyone just, it was my first birth. So it wasn't really they weren't really expecting me to be like three hours in at nine centimeters. So, um, I just remember asking over and over, like, why is this happening to me? (laughs) Why am I in so much pain? And I'm sure they were like, uh, you're having a baby, like, (laughs) duh, but I didn't expect it so fast. And I didn't know I was close. So they didn't, no one told me that and they may have, and I just don't remember, but I thought still like my midwife's words were in my mind of, we'll have a baby by tonight. And it was still 8 a.m. So at some point, my midwife um, looked at, you know, went and checked and she said, you're nine and a half centimeters. You can start pushing. 
And I said, okay. (laughs) And that was really a relief to hear. I think I probably had been feeling pushy, but didn't really know how to articulate it at that point. Yeah. And um, I had kind of lost it a few minutes before that. Like I just started thrashing in the water. I remember just, I'm like, I feel like a caged whale right now. (laughs) Like I'm in the water, just like beached and I can't do anything. (laughs) But, um, so she told me I could start pushing and I was like, yes, finally something I can do. So I remember just screaming at the top of my lungs, trying to push this baby out. And she just stopped me and she was like, stop, you're never going to get your baby out like that. You need to find the deep tones of your voice and like reach down there and push. And so that was like, Oh, okay. So then it was just basically like pooping, you know? (laughs) So I think I only pushed for about 10 minutes, a few pushes and he was born. Oh my gosh. So how was the immediate postpartum, you know, recovery with him? Did you go home quickly or? It was honestly amazing. So everyone (laughs) I talked to who threw up their entire pregnancy, like postpartum is the best because they can eat again. (laughs) It, It was great. And actually, funny story is I am still throwing up um, all the way from his birth. Like, I am having stomach issues, but it's definitely not as much. So I am happy about that. But we can talk about that later. Um, I felt mostly amazing because I had had, like, a pretty good night's sleep before. And then the labor was so super short. So I I think I went home at 12. So, you know, it's that's pretty typical for a birth center, though. You They check the babies out, and then they send you home to sleep in your own bed, which is just one of the parts that I love about it. I know some people are like, you don't, you know, you don't, when in the hospital, they get to take care of you for days and you get a, and I'm like the hospital, like they're waking you up and it's not your own bed. And your husband has to sleep on that weird, like couch thing on the side. And I just loved being able to go home and like be in my own bed. My mom came over and did a bunch of stuff for us. And we just relaxed with our, our newborn. And it was such a sweet, sweet day together. Amazing. Well, um, unless there's anything else you want to share from that postpartum, I'm going to go ahead and get into the twins story so that we can hear about that, if that's okay. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So your kids are pretty close together. I'm doing a little bit of math (laughs) here. So can you tell (laughs) tell us about finding out you were pregnant with the twins? Yeah. So yeah, my kids are 18 months apart. Um, When my son was about 10 months old is when we kind of started not again, not actively trying, but not preventing either. I kind of felt a little bit like emotionally scarred from <laughs> the first pregnancy. And a lot of people had been telling me like, oh, it's it's probably not going to happen to you again. Like it's probably just the first birth, you know, maybe it's just boy. Maybe if you have a girl, it'll be better. Um, but I just felt like I couldn't even like willingly put myself through <laughs> that that pregnancy again. So I kind of just didn't even want to think about it. I was just like, you know what, I'm just going to let God decide whenever the next babies come. Like I was doing really well with uh, my son and just our rhythm. And I felt like it would be fine if we added on another baby. And we've always wanted a lot of kids. We've wanted them close together. Um, And obviously like having a pregnancy like that really made us rethink it. And we were kind of thinking if I did have another pregnancy, like my first, then it'd probably be our last one. So just that in mind, I kind of was like, I don't want to wait around five years for <laughs> for this to happen to me again. Like, I just want to get it over with. So lo and behold, um, the month we stopped actively preventing was the month we got pregnant. So apparently I'm just really fertile. I knew the day I conceived, Bryn, because I was driving to Target with my son in the back seat, And I remember I took a sip of water and I leaned over and I threw it up. Oh my so, gosh, <laughs> no. I was like all right. I'm like, this hasn't happened to me since I was pregnant. Oh no. (laughs) (laughs) So that was kind of like, all right. So four weeks, took a test. It was in fact pregnant. I went to the doctor at five weeks to get my medications because I knew that this pregnancy, I was going to have to start early to be able to kind of like get, because the medications take a little while to kind of kick in. So I wanted to kind of get a jump start on that. And I was already throwing up, um, Obviously, I threw up the at that two week conception point, but I, I had already been throwing up, so I knew I was going to need that. And so they kind of did that quick ultrasound that was like, "All right, it's not ectopic. You're pregnant. Here's all of your medications for the next twenty weeks. <laughs> here you go." So at that point, they're like, "Okay, you've just been here. We just went through this. Like, we know you're going to be sick. 
we'll just give you what you need right now. So you don't have to like keep coming back. Cause I was planning on doing it at the birth center again. Um, so unfortunately the medications did not work like they worked with my son. And, um, at about eight weeks, I started going into the birth center, um, to get IV fluids because I was really dehydrated. So my midwife was able to order IVs and give them to me. And I got them for about three times per week for a couple weeks. And then at some point my veins started blowing out. So they weren't able to um, put the IVs in for me to get the fluid. So after that happened like two or three times, my <laughs> midwife was like, all right, we need a more permanent solution. And the IV fluids had been working really well um, for, to keep me hydrated. But um, by that point, 11 weeks, I had lost about 20 pounds. So that was a lot more serious and fast than with my first pregnancy where I lost 20 pounds total. <laughs> and so I was like, all right, this is going downhill <laughs> really fast. So I was kind of starting to look a little bit gaunt and like pale and sickly. And they were kind of like, all right, we're going to get you a pick line. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> it's basically a little tube that goes from your arm into your heart. Um, so it's like, just like an IV port that, um, is just more permanent. Um, so it is a surgery. So I had to go to the hospital to get that put in, which was a whole nother process, but, um, my doctor was able to order that for me. So the hard part about that was, um, usually with a home health group, um, they want you to have the pick line and take, um, their internal Zofran medication, which I didn't want to do. So I further complicated things by not, by refusing that. And then my in-laws are in the medical field. So they were able to like come administer the IV fluids for me every day instead of getting like a home health group to do it. So they did all of that and they were so wonderful. And I was so thankful for them at the time. And it was kind of just like a good reminder for me that like when you need Western medicine, it's there for you. Um, Cause I had, I'm up to that point. Like I'm not, I'm more holistic, like I said, and um, I prefer the, the natural remedies. But at that point, I was just so thankful for that fluid and that way to, to get it in. Cause at that point I stopped losing weight and I, and I was able to stay more hydrated and the pregnancy just generally went better. Um, I was more energetic. I was still throwing up like probably like eight or nine times a day, but it wasn't so much that I couldn't have any food that I was kept keeping down. And I at least was able to have like the fluids and vitamins so there was only like one or two weird things that happened with the pick line. Like, obviously like you can't get it wet. So, um, like I had to shower, like with my arm out of the shower for my whole pregnancy. <laughs> so that was interesting. Um, and it gets infected really easily. So there is like a danger with that. And I went to the ER a couple of times, just not sure if it was infected or not. So it was definitely like, I was still in and out of the hospital more for the pick line part of it, but it wasn't because I felt like I was dying. So, so that was encouraging. So at what point did you find out you're having twins? Yeah. So we spent so much of the pregnancy, um, taking care of me and the, trying to figure out the hyperemesis that, um, we hadn't really had a whole lot of ultrasounds. Um, it was more just like whenever we were going to the doctor it was always for, you know, the vomiting and the other issues that come out from that. So we just, everything sounded good with the babies every time. Well, at that point it was a baby. <laughs> um, everything sounded good with the baby and they, the heartbeat was great. I felt movement, a lot of movement actually, which made sense later. Um, I, I think I felt the first movement around like 13 or 14 weeks, which is so early. And I was just like, Oh wow, it's just a really active baby. That's so great. Um, I wasn't measuring big at all. I was just measuring normal. So we, di we didn't really feel a need to do any sort of extra ultrasound. So we just did the regular one that you do at the birth center at 20 weeks. So yeah, so we got to the birth center. We were so excited. So I laid down on the bed and she put the little jelly on and my husband and I were all like, oh, we can't wait to see if it's going to be a boy or a girl. We were going to have her write it down so that we could find out, you know, just privately and so she put the, you know, she put the little wand on and then she kind of stopped and I thought something was wrong. So that was kind of a really scary moment. Um, and she said, is this your first ultrasound? And I said, yeah, I mean, we had one at five weeks to make sure I was pregnant, but this is my first one. And she said, 
Okay, I don't know how to tell you this, and I almost lost it. I was so scared. Yeah, that's not what you want to hear. <laughs> and she said, do you know what I'm going to tell you? And I looked at her, and I was like, what are you s-? And then it just dawned on me. I was like, are there two? And she said, yes. And at that point, I was just over the moon. I just, it was... With all that I had been through, just to get to that point, just knowing that there was one healthy baby was going to be enough, but just even knowing there was two and they were both alive and healthy, I just, I felt like God's love so intimately at that moment. I just, I felt so light and free and happy and thankful. It was just such a beautiful moment for me. Um, and my husband too, I think just knowing that we had wanted a big family, but this pregnancy was just maybe not going to make that possible and just feeling like we got two and this, it was just, it was so amazing, Bryn. I, I can't even describe the, the feeling that I had at that moment. And I know most moms are like terrified, but I was just, I was so happy and, and thankful. And, um, we were both like crying and my (laughs) midwife at that point popped her head in was like, Hey, how's it going in here? Like, is there two? And she was completely kidding. And like, then she kind of like (laughs) looked at all of the room and like, we were all crying and everyone was happy. And she's like, what's going on? I'm like, there are two. (laughs) She's like, what? (laughs) And immediately she gets out her measuring tape because, you know, of course she's like, how did I miss that? And she like, she's like measuring my stomach from all angles. I'm like, oh, 20, 21, maybe 20. No, 20. You are definitely 20 weeks. Like there is, you are not bigger at all. Like I would not have known. Because when they're finding the heartbeat, they don't like look for two. They just hear a healthy one and they're like, great. So the really the measuring big was kind of the only indicator because I was so sick my first pregnancy. No one really thought even that. So they just thought, oh, you're a little sicker. It's your second. So there was really just no indication that I had had to, except for, I will say I have a home Doppler and I was trying to find the heartbeat one day. And I thought I heard two, like I, I heard one fast one and another fast one. Um, and my husband had kind of said like, Oh, you're just like hearing your own. And I was kind of like, yeah, you're right. I'm probably just hearing my own, but I kind of was like, Oh, that's interesting. And I didn't really think much about it. Cause my husband kind of like convinced me like, Oh, it's just yours and you're just kind of crazy and it's a do- home Doppler, like how accurate can it be? <laughs> so yeah, so that was a little bit of a surprise. So I kind of was like, I told you so. And he was like, yeah. But then my midwife said, no, he, I would have said the same thing because there, that's very unlikely that you would hear both of them on your home Doppler. So right. I don't know. I just thought it was funny. Interesting. Okay. So then did you have to go in for like a more extensive ultrasound to figure out what type of twins they were and everything? Or did she, was she able to tell you that? So it was a little interesting. <laughs> There's just really no procedure <laughs> for that. So since most people find out really early on that they're having twins, um, they just really get sent in right away to go see a maternal fetal fetal specialist. That's what it's called, right? MFM? Yeah, MFM. Yeah. Um, so uh, this ultrasound with tech was like, I really haven't done twins because they always just go send them right away when I'm doing them. So it was, we just, we still stayed and did it. Um, just, uh, we were there. So it took about two hours actually. And we, and we were just having fun with it too. She was, we have some really great footage of like baby A and back view. And then, you know, baby B comes into front view and, and we were just, you were, we were just having fun together, um, during that couple hours. But she, so she said, Okay, so that was the first, the second question I had to my midwife was, I knew it was going to be high risk now that it was twins. So I said, can I deliver here? She said, well, technically no, because I'm not allowed to, which I knew. But she said, there is one doctor that does out of hospital twins. And I was like, great, what's his number? So the pretty much right after we got out of the, well, she texted him at that point and I think said like, I have a mom who's having twins. Um, like she's going to call you. Um, his name is Dr. Stu. Um, he is one of two doctors who does this in California, which is where I live. Um, so I just felt so blessed to be able to have the opportunity even like, because I, which I found out later, I kind of just blindly went into it just this is what I want to do. That my babies are healthy. There's no reason not to go to the birth center. Um, I have a doctor who will do it. This is great. We went to go see him. 
and um, the babies were um, really close in size. They were die-die twins, so um, very low risk as far as twins go. Um, so he was like, you're a great candidate. You had a really fast, easy birth the first time. Your babies are head down. Even if um, baby B would flip, then I can go in and get her. I know how to do breech extractions. So that just made me so comfortable. I wasn't worried at all. I didn't have really any fear um, after talking to him and my midwife. So the fear kind of more set in as I talked to other people. So, of course, you go like join the twin groups and <laughs> talk to other twin parents. And there's just so much fear people have over twins and because it is technically high risk. Um, so that was really hard because I was really confident. I, you know, I, I had done a little research on my doctor and just asked him, you know, how has a twin birth gone? Like, have you had to ever transfer? Like, you know, and he said, I've had no emergencies and he's done like a couple hundred, I believe of breach and twin birth out of hospital. So that was a very good number (laughs) for me. And, um, yeah, we actually have, I'm just going to plug this really quick, uh, episode 289, the mom goes on and on about Dr. Stu, who <laughs> helped her kind of navigate a vaginal um, breach twin birth. Is um, that Jennifer? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I listened to her story and I was like, Dr. Stu, I think yeah. I might have been pregnant at the time. I'm like, I know him. That's he's my amazing. doctor. That's <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Yeah. He's really great. And he's really passionate about educating other doctors about breach and just um, to do it because it's becoming a lost art, which is really so sad to me. And um I just, I have other twin moms who I know and like just online hearing just the the fear of delivering in hospital and having the double whammy, which I think it was either Julie or Natalie. Julie, yeah, she shared the double whammy, which is when you have one vaginally and one by cesarean. And when you're told that potential, of course, you're going to be like, okay, well, let's just do the cesarean because I don't want both. Yes. So he's really passionate about educating other doctors about being able to do breach, which I think is just so awesome. Um, and he's, he's great. He'll, yeah, he, he was really great. He had a lot of information for me, um, about that. And cause I would kind of be going, like, I would be hearing things about, you know, whatever I was doing. A lot of people t- told me I was putting my kids in jeopardy, which is hard to hear. Yeah. Um, and you know, a lot of people would, were saying like, well, half of twins come early. So why are you even trying to go to do a vaginal birth at a birth center. Like you're probably not going to even be able to, um, just a lot of negativity. I, I just really didn't understand it. And I was thinking like, like, shouldn't you be like encouraging me? And like, I understand that it might not go how I want it to, but I mean, this is better for me. This is better for my babies to be able to do like a, if it goes well and I'm able to carry them to full term, like that's a good thing. And being able to deliver them vaginally, like, that's a good thing. <laughs> like, yeah, it almost feels like people are, like, hoping for the worst just to prove a point. <laughs> yes. That's how I yeah. thought when people were, like, negative about my home birth. I'm like, why do you care? This is <laughs> – I've done my research. This is my decision. And when you're not yes. supporting me, it just feels like you want – you don't want the best for me. Yeah. And I know that wasn't necessarily the case with everyone who made comments like that, but I think they were, were trying just to kind of like prepare me. Like you have this idealistic vision of this thing and it's really not going to happen. So you just shouldn't even hope. (laughs) So, um, anyway, so I think that made me even a little more determined, um, (laughs) to, to carry them. And obviously I know I have no control over that, but I, I do think that just the power of positive thinking and, not hoping for the worst does really impact your body. Um, cause I was still super, super sick for the whole pregnancy. And I, I mean, a lot of moms who do have hyperemesis, um, do get induced pretty early on because it is so hard and just so difficult. And you're just really ready to be done and ready to eat again. And your body is really deteriorating in a lot of ways. And I was just really determined to do what was best for my babies and be able to get them to a place where they were going to be healthy and um, able to breathe on their own and eat on their own. And I really wanted that for them. And I really didn't care that I was suffering. I just really wanted them to be healthy. And I knew that I would get through this (laughs) one way or another. But um, it's just, it's such a short time. Like it does feel like eternity, but that at the same time, it's, it is a short time in your life. And with my son, I just felt like it was eternity. And I remember thinking with him, like, why did I get pregnant? Like, this isn't worth it. 
and he came out and he 100% was. And with my twin pregnancy, I remember just looking at him and thinking, I'm doing this for you. Like I'm doing this for the babies, but like, this is what I'm going to get at the end. Like, this is my, my prize. This is my goal. Like I get, I get another one of you. And when I found out I was two, I get another two of you. And this is so worth it. And it's just such a short time that you are pregnant that I really wanted to get them to a place where they were healthy and, and thankfully I was able to. So I was really thankful about that. All right. So tell me about your birth story. If there's nothing else from the pregnancy. Uh, yeah. So, uh, one thing I will add is at 34 weeks, I got the flu. Oh no. What time of so, year was it? That was December when oh, everyone gosh. was getting the flu. That's the and worst so, part about a winter baby. It was the worst. I, with my son, I wasn't really pregnant that long during the winter. So I was kind of just blissfully unaware that this could happen and how terrible it was. <laughs> so um, actually, I should back up a little bit. At 33 weeks, I was planning on having the pick line in until maybe like 37 or 38 weeks, like right before I was expecting the twins to, you know, reasonably come out. Um, I accidentally pulled it out, like, because it's just a line. Like, it's just, it, there's nothing really attaching it but some tape. So I was dreaming, like, you know how you have those really crazy, intense pregnancy dreams? Apparently, like, I was dreaming and I pulled it out. So one morning I woke up and there was, like, blood all over me, my arm. And my pick line was, like, halfway out. They weren't able to put it back in, which was a real bummer because I really could have used those fluids when I had the flu. So that happened at 33 weeks. And then 34 weeks, I got the flu, which was really difficult. And, you know, like, you can't really take anything and you can't breathe and you can't sleep. So I spent a lot of nights crying in the shower. <laughs> Because I was so congested and uh, I got the stomach flu and then I got the, another strain. So I was sick probably the whole month of December. So I kind of knew my babies weren't going to come when I was sick because your body just, I just couldn't have handled it at that point. So I got better around 37 weeks and I started to feel a little better. And um, we took my son, I remember, I just was feeling like, I didn't want them to come. I was so tired. I was so exhausted from the flu and just being pregnant. And I knew that once they came out, like I was going to have to, like, it wasn't going to stop. Like I wasn't all of a sudden not going to be tired or feel better. So I kind of was like, oh, I'm not really ready for them yet. Like I still need to rest and like recuperate a little bit. And when I turned 38 weeks plus five, same thing. I woke up at 3.30 a.m., heard the pop, got on the toilet, my water broke. Um, I knew from this time that it was going to be fast. I did not want to get in the shower and get my house all watered down. So I called my midwife, told her my water broke and I was coming in. She said, all right, I'll get the team. So she did all the calling of, I think there was six people that were going to be there. So it was her, Dr. Stu, um, two midwives assistants. And then, um, my midwife, there was a midwife in the practice with Silas's birth that had twins. She didn't actually deliver my twins, but she was there and I knew her. And, and so she also wanted to come because she was like an out of hospital twin birth. That's awesome. And she really wanted to be there. So that was really special to be able to have, have her there as well. So she called all the people and um, I called my mom to come get my son because it was still 3.30 in the morning. So she got there around 4.15 and by that time, my contractions were well underway and I knew it was going to be fast. So, but I could actually walk to the car this time. So that was a plus. Um, so my husband and I handed off my son, we got in the car and again, I transitioned in the car, which was terrible, <laughs> but this time I was able to really know what was going on. So I was much more present. I did not cuss my whole, my whole birth, which I was really proud of. Like that was my goal. I'm like, I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to be present. I'm going to be aware of what I'm saying. We're going through without any cuss words. <laughs> so that was my goal. Um, and so I got to the birth center around 445. And at that point, um, I really couldn't walk. <laughs> so my husband like was able to get me out of the car. And I remember like leaning over the car and just started mooing. And I was really taken aback because I hadn't, I had always thought that was super weird when people mood, but it was just like this automatic response to what was going on. And I was, you know, just sitting there mooing and my whole birth team actually had just gotten there too. So they were all walking, like kind of like watching. And one of my, one of the midwives assistants came over and like started helping me up the stairs and, and we got in into the center and, and my midwife like put her hand on my back and tried to start like guiding me over 
to the room and I just started screaming at her like, don't touch me, stop touching me. Cause I had just was in like so much writhing pain that I didn't like want anyone to really even come close to me. So I got myself in the, in the room and then I looked at my doctor and I was just like, can I start pushing now, please? And he said, yeah, probably. And I was kind of joking. So I was like, really? So he's like, well, yeah, let me check you. So he checked me and he was like, yep, you're nine and a half centimeters. So they had been filling up the tub. So I got in the tub and yeah, I think 10 minutes later, first baby was born. So that was really fast and even faster than I kind of really was expecting. But um, like I said, it was just, it was a lot better in the sense that I knew it was going on. I was expecting the back labor. I was expecting the intensity. I was expecting the speed. So it just made it really a lot easier to cope just having that knowledge of what was going on. And yeah, so baby A came out, they put her on my chest. And that was a little bit of a hard moment for me because I was really wanting to just enjoy her for the moment that she was there with me. And, but I was shaking really, really badly from just everything. I think there's the speed and the hormones and I, I was shaking uncontrollably. And all I could think was, oh, I have to do this again. And I have to push another baby out. This is going to really be a bummer. So she was on me and um, for a little while. And so eventually I kind of was just like, all right, like um, trying to enjoy her a little bit and looking at her and, and seeing her features. And um, about 10 minutes in, um, Dr. Stu was monitoring baby B's heartbeat and um, kind of said, all right, it's not sounding good. So we need to get her out. But at that point, I wasn't really contracting. So I was a little bit like sensing the urgency, but not really knowing what to do about it. Um, so they took baby A and cut her cord, which I also was not expecting because I really wanted the cord blood to all drain. But I wasn't really like thinking that through and no one really knew how long it was going to take for baby B to come out or what needed to happen. So and no one really had told me like, oh, we might need to cut it really fast. So I was a little bit like, what, what, like you're cutting it. And then they were kind of like, yeah, baby B needs to come out. And I kind of wasn't thinking like, oh, like she can't be attached while <laughs> I'm pushing out her sister. So they took her away and gave her to my husband. And then um, I still wasn't really having contractions. So Dr. Stu started kind of like pushing on the top of my stomach, kind of encouraging my uterus to start contracting again, which actually works. And she came out really fast in two pushes. <laughs> so that was really exciting. And then as she was crowning, he said, would you like to grab her? Would you like to catch her? And which we hadn't really talked about, but I was like, yes, I do. Can I do that? And so I grabbed her and brought her up to my chest. And that was just such a surreal moment for me, being able to catch my twin birth in the water. I It was just, I I felt so at peace and so excited that everything had happened. And no one had been told that we were even at the birth center at that point. Besides my mom, my mom was the only one who knew that I was even in labor. So not only had, were we in labor, my twins had been born and none of my family had been even like told that I was at the birth center. So that was kind of a funny thought after they came out, just because it happened so fast, we didn't really have time to to text anyone or let anyone know to pray for us or anything like that. So, so they got the text, you know, at whatever it was, 6 a.m. saying, our babies are here. Um, so that was really, really neat, um, a neat experience. Amazing. So did you want to share something from this postpartum journey? Since I know that twins is kind of a different ball game. <laughs> it is. So actually with, with my son, I wasn't able to, feed him at my breast. Um, he, he had a severely latched tongue. And so actually the day he was born, we went to go get it, um, reversed cause they don't do that. Like in a hospital, the midwives don't do that. So we, we drove all the way, like an hour away from the birth center on the day he was born to go, to go get that done. Forgot about that. Um, and he, yeah, he never, he never latched, he never transferred the milk. So that was really discouraging for me. So I ended up pumping with him for 10 months until I became pregnant with the twins. And at that point, my milk was just completely dry and I was vomiting. So I wasn't really able to, to provide that milk for him anymore. But just having that experience, I was very like cagey about what was going to be happening with the twins because my midwife is a lactation consultant and there was 
two, two lactation consultants at the practice. And both of them were so sweet trying to help me with him. And, and they just like kind of said, we don't know what's going on. And I was like, is this normal? She's like, no, there are, I can count on my hands, the babies that I have helped that I don't know why they're not sucking. Like every other time, like it's either, you know, poor milk supply or this or that. But with your baby, I don't know why he'd never drink milk <laughs> from your breast. So that was like a little bit discouraging. And, but she said, don't worry, but the twins is going to be different. Twins will, we're going to get them feeding. Like Silas was kind of like one in a million kind of thing. Like that's not going to happen again. Unfortunately, it's not the case. <laughs> so, um, we tried to breastfeed and they were really trying, but they just weren't able to also transfer the milk. And we tried a lot of different things, just the same as we did with Silas. And I was kind of doing this thing where I was trying to nurse with them one one at a time because, I mean, I think most twin moms will tell you nursing, tandem nursing newborn twins is pretty much impossible without like 10 people <laughs> because they're just so floppy and you have to compress and um, it's just really hard to do it unless they're already like doing really well or advanced or something. So I don't know. I haven't heard of a whole lot of twin moms that tandem until a little bit later, like two or three months. So I kind of knew that wasn't going to be the case, but it just made it really hard because I would be nursing for like 30 to 40 minutes with one twin, then like finger feeding them, like basically like putting your finger in and then like teaching them how to suck and then having that tube syringe of milk and, and feeding them that way. And then I would try to feed the other twin for another 30 to 40 minutes and then have to feed her through a syringe because she wasn't really nursing and then pump after all of that. So, I mean, I was feeding those girls for like, I don't know, probably like 10 hours a day in the beginning, which was super tiring and very defeating and frustrating. And, um, so the lactation consultants, um, said, we don't know what's going on. Like, but the reality is there's two. So you really need to rethink like what you can actually handle. At some point I decided to just pump at night and then do the, trying the feedings during the day. And so that went on for about six to eight weeks. And I was just so exhausted at that point. Um, cause it didn't really seem like there was a whole lot of progress. I didn't mention too, they had the same tongue tie. So we had gotten those reversed as well, but that didn't really seem to help. Um, and then a friend told me, to try asking an occupational therapist for help, which is something that I never even thought about with Silas. So she gave me the number of one of her friends um, who's an occupational therapist. She came to my house for free. She is amazing. Um, it was so sweet of her because at that point we had really like spent a lot of time and money and I was like, I really can't afford an occupational. So she came to my house for free and was just so compassionate and kind. And so she kind of evaluated their sex and told me that they had um, tight jaws and a very small mouth. So that was that combination of things was making it so that they were clamping down on my breast so hard that they were able to like get out the nipple. Like their suck was too strong. So she tested that out by putting a bottle in their mouth and then like seeing how hard the bottle uh, clamped down. And so she's like, these babies are like clamping down so hard on your breast. Like, don't you feel that? And I was like, not really. And I think I just been, the nipple was like numb from pumping for all those months. But anyway, so she showed me some exercises to be able to like loosen out their mouth. And after a few weeks, they started transferring the milk. Um, so that was pretty amazing. And I was so happy about that. And um, yeah, we just did those exercises like pretty regularly every day. And it was a very slow process. And one, I definitely wanted to give up. I, I remember calling her one time and I was like, I just can't, I can't do this anymore. Like, I'm so tired. I'm so frustrated. Like it just, it felt like a constant failure because even if one twin like did well during a feeding, the other twin wouldn't. And so it was like, I always was failing <laughs> because, you know, one of them wasn't ever doing well. And usually it was like only one feeding out of eight or two feedings out of eight. And it was just really defeating. So just having that support team, postpartum was really helpful. Just, I called and they're like, you can do this. Just give it one more day, one more, you know, one more, one more. And eventually they started breastfeeding. Um, that was about three months for one and four months for the other that they were able to feed like without a nipple shield from my breast, 100% of the time, no supplementing with pumped milk. Um, and it got a lot easier at about six months. I was able to tandem and we are still breastfeeding. I'm so thankful to say, and it's going really well. 
That's like such an amazing success story after <laughs> I'm sure all the emotions from your son's experience. Yes. I, I was pretty, I, I came into it feeling so discouraged about that, that it was, it was really hard to keep going with them. I felt like giving up even more than with my son and just because there was two and my 18 month old who I'm like, what am I going to do with him for 10 hours while I'm feeding my twins? Like it was just the logistics of it was pretty hard to figure out. Yeah, for sure. Um, do you have any tips as far as what you did with your 18 month old? (laughs) Um, I had a, I'm a pretty scheduled person, so I kind of had a schedule for him and he, he doesn't watch TV, which I'm sure every mother out there is like, what? Like, how can I get that for my kids? But it's actually was kind of a a bummer at that point because I would have liked it for like a, an hour at least. But, um, so I kind of like did, um, crib time with him or it would be like book time. So every feeding was something different. I also tried to schedule his naps during like when I had to be on the couch Um, And then I I had someone come and get him for like an hour or two a day. Just at that point, I wasn't really able to spend a whole lot of time with him just because the newborns were pretty crazy. So um, he was able to get my family was pretty close. So he was able to get one on one time with Nina or aunties or that kind of thing. So I tried to have it be like the same time every day because I feel like he was used to that more rather than just like haphazard, you know. Here, you're going here today, you're going here today. So yeah, I, I tried to do like morning time and he was like, had someone that was going to come get him and then he was used to it and he would ask for it. So he he knew what, what time was what and I would sit down and he would say, you know, book time, mommy feeds sisters. <laughs> so it was, it was cute. He was, he was pretty clueless about what was, go- what was going on. So we showed him the babies and he was kind of like one, two, but that was really all he could really process in his 18 month old mind. So yeah, he was still a baby himself, honestly. Yeah, for sure. Mine are ni- my first two are 19 months apart, so I know that, <laughs> how that goes. Um, well, I feel like you've sprinkled a lot of really great resources throughout the story, but are there any extras that you want to add here at the end? Um, I would say there is a book on HG. I gave the link in the show notes page. Yeah, but, we'll put it on the show notes. Um, that was really helpful when I was feeling really like depressed and kind of like not knowing what was going on and no one was really able to um, kind of explain to me. That was a really helpful book, just processing through my emotions and also just the physical part of it. It also had some really great tips. Like there are a lot of things you can test for, um, H. pylori, different bacteria that also could be causing that that only show up in pregnancy, which wasn't the case for me, but is a case for some women. Um, so just reading through that and then, yeah, like I said, the baby center group was super helpful. It was pretty much the only active one that I found. So I'd highly recommend that specific group, not just necessarily any group on hyperemesis. Um, so yeah, if you're pregnant and <laughs> this is happening to you, you are not alone. There are other people out there and, and just having them around you to support you was really helpful. And then the other one, I think I was thinking for breastfeeding is breastfeeding multiples. Um, that one was really helpful because... Anything, once you have twins, like anything, I'm, this has been said, but anything on singletons kind of gets thrown out the window. Like the principles are the same, but like logistics are just so different that you kind of need to really read specific books and probably like don't get on the baby center app. I think there's one, there's one, I can't remember what it is right now, but there is one app that is specifically for twins. I should have linked to that one, but that one was more helpful because it was like, you gained 20 pounds, not like you gained five. So And there are different things like that where you're doubling in size, you're doubling in weight. And so like just reading the regular apps are a little (laughs) disappointing. Yeah, I've seen in some of them it'll it'll show like a special thing to go check out a different spot if you have twins. Yes. I guess maybe that's a a newer feature on some of them, but I can see how that would be different. (laughs) Like the size of a watermelon except two (laughs) cantaloupes actually. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, you do have a great list of resources. So I'm going to put all of those on the show notes page. And then did you want to share where people can find you online to connect? Sure. I'm on Instagram at Hannah McCary. So I have a public profile. So yeah, if you have any questions or want to reach out um, for the twins or hyperemesis or the latches or all the random things that happen to me, um, you can private message me. All right. Perfect. Well, I'll put that on the show notes as well. Thank you so much for sharing your stories with us. Thanks for having me. It was it was fun and it felt like closure after this whole year. So it was I one of my goals was to be able to write down and get all the details. So this was perfect. 
Awesome. All right. Well, thanks again, Hannah. Thanks. Okay, now we're going to chat with Trisha from Peanut, today's sponsor. And don't forget, you can go to thebirthhour.com slash peanut to get a direct link to download the app, or you can search for it in your app store and download it for free today. Hi, Trisha. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today to chat with me about Peanut. Hi, how are you? Doing well. Can you start by telling listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do for Peanut? Sure. My name is Trisha Bowden, and I lead the Peanut Ambassador MVP program. So our MVPs are our most valued peanuts, and they're basically our feet on the ground. They're helping to spread the word about the peanut community and to help us grow. That sounds like a lot of fun. I bet it's changed a little bit during uh, the pandemic. It has, but it's gotten more interesting. I mean, it's a very unique ambassador program where these are just, you know, our everyday users. It's not, um, it's unlike your typical ambassador programs where you look for, you know, influencers and followers. These are really just women who are going through different life stages, whether it be um, trying to conceive or um, pregnancy and motherhood, and are just really trying to help spread the word and provide the support. And we give them the flexibility of hours and they get, they get compensated um, for it. So it's a really great opportunity for them. Very cool. Yeah, I'm always amazed by the power of like a mom spreading the word just (laughs) online or in person. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about Peanut and just what it is and how it works. Sure. Um, So Peanut is really an app that helps you get through all stages of motherhood. So from the very moment that you think about becoming a mother when you're trying to conceive or navigating fertility, to expecting and being pregnant, um, through going through adoption processes and surrogacy, and of course, you know, being a mother. Um, PINA provides that support. And what we do is we really help connect women to one another who are in the similar life stages. Um, for me, it was, you know, I was a new mom and I was looking for um, a friend that was nearby that had a child the same age where we could just meet up at the park and kind of connect on different experiences that we were going through. But other times women are really navigating very specific circumstances and we're able to kind of find the right person to connect you with to help you get through that. So you can get that support, ask questions. And alongside that, um, outside of connecting you with woman to woman, it's Uh, support groups. So there's lots of topic groups, um, such as expecting, fertility, postpartum support, where you can really find like your pretty much like group of moms and your community. Um, There's also some serious topics that the groups center around like abuse, um, mental health issues, and then things that um, some moms just find a really hard time Um, relating to, which is, you know, raising a child with special needs. Yeah, I think it's really cool how specific it gets. When I created my account, it asks like all your different interests and there's so many to choose from. And then I just played around with it a little bit to see what the different options would lead me. So I tried the trying to conceive option and it shows me this personalized feed of other people who are kind of in the same stage, which is so cool. And then I tried it for pregnancy and it allows you to put in how many weeks along you are. And then it's showing people who are, you know, similarly you know, 16 weeks long and that kind of thing. And it's like almost like a personalized feed that you would see on another social media app, but it's, you know, takes it to another level. And then I imagine, I mean, I can tell from the way that it worked to sign in that it's much more uh, secure and private. Can you talk about that aspect? Yes. So um, the women on our platform are really protected by our safety measures. I mean, we don't let anybody on the platform unless they're verified And it's really a place where you can talk about anything. Again, back to very simple, just getting tips on motherhood or raising your child or, you know, is this normal? I'm at X, um, you know, my ninth month of pregnancy and I'm feeling this. The things that are a bit more private, um, even issues around sex, which can be fun, but also very serious. Mm -hmm. Um, We make sure that we protect our users and that, um, you you know, you have the option of being incognito if that's something that makes you feel comfortable um, but it really is a safe place where you can open up and find that support where on other platforms you wouldn't. Right. So one of the ways it seemed like the verification was happening was through, it had me take like a selfie. It was, yeah. you know, it said, this is not anything that's going to be put on your profile, but we just want to see that you're a real person. So that only works in that moment through your phone versus someone like uploading a selfie, right? Yes, correct. Okay. 
So there's a few different features, like you said, the groups and the support, but then there's also this ability to, you know, make a one-on-one friend, like maybe a dating app. So can you explain how that works? Right. So when you um, first download Peanut, you're basically creating your profile and you're indicating certain things about yourself, like where you live, um, different interests that you like. Mine personally is like wine time, food first. That's all me. And then you can indicate what stage you are in terms of your journey through motherhood. So whether you're trying to conceive um, a mother and how old your children are or pregnant, uh, we will basically introduce you to moms that are at the similar life stage and in your location if you choose. You also have the option of expanding um, your location. But really, that's what it's about is like matchmaking on the level of finding someone to go along that journey with that you can relate to, that you can ask questions to, and that can support one another. Yeah, it seems like it's very, um, like the the intelligence behind it is very specific with finding the right groups for you. When I signed up, it like knew my neighborhood group, not just my city and, you know, sent me an invitation if I wanted to join that. So making, you know, those connections really close to home, which is very convenient when you have weird nap schedules and all kinds of things going on with kids. Especially if you're pregnant, um, what we're doing now is we're calling it Bump Buddies is when you do download peanut and you indicate your birth month or expected due date, um, we will automatically put you in a group with other women with the same due date. So that's that's just a really um, great thing to do because at that point, you're already in a group with so many women that are going through likely the same thing as you. Um, so that's when kind of like you really need it most. That's cool. So working with the ambassadors, have you heard any really great stories that you want to share or ways that people love to use the app more than, you know, all the other ways or anything that stands out that you want to share? Sure. There's actually a really interesting um, story about one of our MVPs. She's in New York City. Um, Her name is Sam. And she is pregnant with her second child or was pregnant with her second child during COVID, right? Her due date was in May. And unfortunately, um, none of her family from out of state could come in to help. And her husband was a doctor. So it really was kind of like a crunch time for her to figure out what is she going to do with her toddler if she has to go in for delivery, you know, at an unexpected moment. So she had met another woman on Peanut um, in, in a similar neighborhood to her, adjacent to hers in New York City who happened to also become an ambassador and they became such great friends that when she did give birth, she asked this mom, this fellow MVP to come in and watch her son while she was in the hospital. And she did. And that was just such an amazing story. So sweet. She took pictures of when she gave birth at the hospital and she had such a proud look on her face. They were beautiful. And she shared these pictures and her story about meeting this uh, wonderful friend on peanut across all of these other social um, groups that she's part of. And that actually really, you know, emotionally triggered these women. And they saw what the power can be when you have a great support system. And it actually helped her um, grow the peanut community. That is so cool. I just got yeah. goosebumps hearing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that really speaks to the whole it takes a village aspect that's so hard to find these days when we move around a lot and maybe aren't, you know, staying in the same city our whole lives. So I love that y'all are helping make those connections happen. Yeah, it's really interesting because um, you can you might use peanut in different ways when you're at different stages in your life. And I've kind of been through a few Um, I joined Peanut in 2017, um, right after I had my son. We lived in California. He was one years old, and we decided to move back to New York, where our families were. But I didn't have any mom friends with um, children the same age. And I was really like, I need to find a mom friend. So as we all need them. I Googled, like, making mom friends, and I came across Peanut. And then that's how I, I got on the app and I was able to make like a couple of mom friends I could just go to the park with and, and, and hang out and have play dates. And it was really great. After that point, I kind of just got more into the community groups and just looking for advice on the different milestones that occur between the ages of like one and two. And then I found myself using peanut for another reason, because we were trying to conceive again and having, having our second child. And unfortunately, um, I had a miscarriage, which just, 
even changed the way that I use peanut more so because then I was really, I found out I had a uterus abnormality, which I'd never heard of. So naturally I was just looking for others who mm-hmm. might have the same thing or have heard of it or could shed any, you know, advice. And it, what was so great um, within peanut is that I found very specific groups um, that were created by women that had the same thing, but they all were trying to keep all the support in like a a positive manner. Mm. There weren't any, you know, negative stories about that. Everyone was just like, it's, it's going to be okay. Um, you know, I have the same thing, but look what turned out. I have like this beautiful son. And, and that was, that was so important for me because I had this miscarriage right in the beginning of COVID. So I really needed it. Yeah. That's so, so important to be able to find that support. And like you said, like a positive place versus maybe Mm -hmm. going down a Google rabbit hole or something. Right. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me today. I really appreciate your time. Sure. Thank you so much, Bryn. Thank you so much again to Hannah for sharing her birth story with us and to Peanut for sponsoring this episode. Don't forget, you can go to thebirthhour.com slash peanut to download the Peanut app today. And if you want more information from today's episode, including all those resources from Hannah, head over to thebirthhour.com and search for her name in the search bar. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.